tell me what the age of three to her. So the Oh, you have to read Dave's card to me, and it's something similar. Oh, right. Yeah, then I listen to clapping again. It's going to the top of my head. Yeah, don't think I'm cut off, that's right. Right, we'll start now anyway. I think Jonathan's got a, a phone call, so we'll start with a word of prayer. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be always were acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming today. I know we're a bit thin on the ground, but... What I'm going to say today probably will sound like I'm having a go at the Catholic Church. I'm not, they're just wrong, okay? <laughs> <laughs> what, what I'm going to look at is the person of Peter, because Peter's obviously from Pentecost, um, the first eight chapters basically of um, Acts, is quite an important character. Um, if you look at your notes, this is what the Catholics believe about Peter. He was the first bishop in Antioch, and, or sorry, the first pope, I should say, really, in Antioch and Rome. He was the rock in which the, on which the church is built. He holds the keys of heaven. Can you see on the right-hand side you've got the, the papal insignia with the, the keys on it. And because... Peter was the first Pope in Rome. The Pope therefore has apostolic primacy, which is a posh meaning seeing he's the boss, and he's the, the complete boss. In fact, at one stage the Pope even announced that they are infallible. I believe the, the story is that the, the Pope at the time arranged all these mirrors so that the light would shine on him as he made this announcement. And all the cardinals and everybody else turned up, and then a whopping great big storm rolled in, and it was black. <laughs> he had to do it by candlelight. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But if, if it isn't true, God should have made it true. But anyway. <laughs> I'm going to show you why they think these things, and then I'm going to show you what they actually mean. Because it is important to understand the position of Peter in the Bible. Um, let's go to Matthew 16 to start with. This is where most of it comes from. So we're going to Matthew 16 and we're looking at 13 to 20. Now this is after Jesus had done what I call remedial training with his disciples for some time. He's taken them off into the Gentile regions and he's been trying to retrain them all the things he thought they had learnt and they hadn't. And this is, as it were, the final test. So verse 13 of uh, Matthew 16. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, he began asking his disciples, saying, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they were saying, Some say John the Baptist. I'm not sure quite how they worked that out, given they were alive at the same time, anyway. Others say Elijah. Others say Jer Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples they should not tell, uh, tell no one that he was the Christ. But when you read that, Peter's the rock on which the church is built. Peter has the keys of heaven. Peter's the chief disciple. So you can imagine later on the popes yes we we follow after peter that they have this legend i don't quite know how they get it firstly that peter was crucified in rome which is quite possible but secondly that he got there and became the bishop of rome before they did that to him and he spent time ministering in rome and became the first bishop and apostolics have you heard of apostolic succession yeah. the church is big into that um 
the idea is that, that one priest will bless another priest or appoint another priest who would appoint another one who will appoint another one and so on down the line so the idea is apostolic succession is whoever priest you have should have been blessed in continuous line right back up to peter and the first disciples now the catholic church don't believe that the protestant church they, they think they broke it because they broke away so they we're not in apostolic succession or any other baptists and weirdos like that you know None of them are in apostolic succession. So they believe that the, the Pope is in apostolic primacy directly from Peter. Therefore, he holds the keys of heaven. Now, from their point of view, especially during the Middle Ages, that didn't mean opening heaven up to people, that meant locking against them. So if you didn't do what we tell you to, we'll lock the doors of heaven, we'll excommunicate you, and you will be locked out of heaven. And the idea that you are the rock in which the church is built on. So the rock is built on the Pope. It is built on the Catholic Church. So you have to do what you're told. I don't imagine all Catholics believe that for one second. But during the Middle Ages especially, that's what happened. I'm not a great believer in apostolic succession. Um, some of the original popes were no better than gangsters they were warlords there's a famous story of what they call i think the the supper of the chestnuts where one pope was chucking chestnuts on the floor and had naked prostitutes picking them up would that man would god have passed on apostolic succession through that man there's a bishop in this country if you've done the c of e um, training and um, safeguarding training a bishop who was abusing children he was blessed and set as a bishop he has blessed other people as priests and bishops do you think God would pass on apostolic succession through that so I'm not a great believer in what the church calls apostolic succession but I want you I want to show you what these things actually mean in the Bible going through Peter so first of all Let's go to Genesis. Do you know what the... Actually, what, what, first of all, what Peter says, you are the Christ. He wouldn't have said the word Christ, because that's a Greek word. Um, he would have said, got some words underneath there, Messiah, or most, more likely Hamashiach, which is the Hebrew. Hamashiach. So what does that actually mean? It's got a clue written next to it on your notes. Anointed one. So one who is anointed. So when you call someone as Messiah, that's the person who is anointed. Do you know what the first anointing in the Bible is? Christ is a king. No, not necessarily a king. First anointing. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 28. It's virtually always in Genesis. Genesis 28. It's rather a strange one. You know the story, but you probably don't realise it. Uh, it's 28 and it's uh, 10 to 21. <clears throat> this is after Jacob has just deceived his father and is being sent away before his brother kills him. And Jacob departed from Bathsheba and went towards Haran. And he came to a certain place and he spent the night there because the sun was set. And he took a stone and placed it and put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he had a dream. And behold, a ladder was set on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of your father Abraham and of the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and, you, to, and to your descendants. Your descendants shall also be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south and you uh, and in you and your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed behold i am with you and i will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for i will not leave you until i have done what i promised then jacob awoke from his sleep and said surely the lord is in this place and i did not know it and he was afraid and said how awesome is this place this is none other than the house of God. This is the gates of heaven, or gate of heaven. 
Remember that, we'll need that later on. Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on the top of it. And he called the name of the place Bethel, because previously the name had been called Luz. We can leave it there. Later on, God tells Jacob to go back to the place where the stone was that you anointed. So the first thing that was ever anointed in the Bible was a stone. Which is odd. Let's go to, one, uh, to John, John chapter 1. Many moons ago, when I first started digging deeper, I did this one. This is um, the calling of Nathaniel. Um, some of you may remember it. Many, many moons ago. Let's read it and then I'll, I'll point out what's going on here. So it's uh, uh, 43 to 51. And this is Jesus. Next day, he purposed to go into Galilee and he found Philip, and Jesus said to him, follow me. Now Philip, who was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him who Moses in the law um, and also the, the prophets wrote about, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said, can any th good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and he st said to him, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. That's a bit dramatic, just seeing somebody under a fig tree, isn't it? And Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You shall see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you shall see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now when you first look at that, you're thinking, well, what on earth is Jesus saying? How has Nathaniel had this sudden revelation from what Jesus said. You need to understand that the, the rabbis taught that when you meditated on scripture, the best place to do it is under a fig tree. And if you assume that, what's the, med what's, the, what's the passage he's meditating on then? An Israelite whom is no guile. Take it the other way around. An Israelite who is guileful. A deceiving Israelite whose name used to be Jacob. And then you take the bit about the angels descending and ascending on the Son of Man. And you realise that Nathaniel was meditating and thinking about that passage we've just read in the Old Testament. And he's not looking at Jesus at the top of the ladder, he's looking at Jesus at the bottom of the ladder. What was at the bottom of the ladder? The stone anointed. It's hardly new. Go to Deuteronomy 32. This was not a new concept to the, the Jews. Song of Moses. Give ear, O heavens, and let me speak. Let the words, let the earth hear the words of my mouth. Let my teachings drop as rain, my speech distill as dew, even the droplets on the fresh grass and the showers of herbs. For I will proclaim the name of the Lord Ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect, and all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. So the idea Israel already had, that their God was the rock. If you remember the, the, in the desert, when the, the Moses struck the rock, it said that God stood in the rock. And it was the rock that followed them. They later on, they talked about, in fact, some of the rabbis had this strange idea that there's this big stone rolled after the people of Israel in the, in the desert. Don't ask me where they got it from, but because it, it said the rock that followed them. Because mm -hmm. um, there was a number of times when the rock was, two times when the rock was struck and one time they dug and water came out. Mm -hmm. But the idea that the God is a rock was quite an idea to them. 
And so you have an anointed rock. You have Jesus standing at the bottom of this ladder as the Messiah. We don't need to look up the next one. The wise and foolish man. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The actual foundation, if you think about what Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of, uh, the son of the living God. Go to Genesis 15. This is one of the foundational verses of the whole of Scripture. God has been talking to Abraham. He's made him a promise. And this is Abraham's response. Verse 6, Genesis 15. He believed in the Lord and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. So here's Peter believing in Jesus. There's two words used in the Greek. You've got them both there. Petros, a stone. Petra, a rock. You know Petra, half as old as time, Rose Red City, half as old as time? I know some of you have been there. The idea of this great, enormous rock. Peter's name was Petros, a stone. A pebble. Can you see underneath? You've got the, um, it's one of the monasteries, I think, in Turkey. There's a monastery built on a rock. But it's built out of pebbles. It's built out of uh, stones. So what Jesus was saying there, that the rock on which the church is built is that statement of faith of Peter's. And the statement of faith is in God, the rock. And Peter is he's an important, he's a cornerstone of the church, but he is not the one that the church is built on. He is one who has been built on the foundation. If we go to Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul confirms this, uh, 10 to 11. <coughs> Appalled into the grace of God, which was given to me as a master build builder, I laid a foundation and others are built upon it. Let each man be careful how he builds upon it, for no, uh, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. So Peter is not the rock. It's interesting in the Latin Bible, they don't have two separate words. They have the same word for both. But then they are being slightly biased on the, the, the translation there. So, sorry Peter, you're not a rock mate. What about the, the doorkeeper of heaven? Have you, you've got this picture of the pearly gates with St Peter standing outside, either letting people in. Have you seen all the cartoons? And there were tons of cartoons. Back in Matthew, did you notice when Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah. What have you got? Did you have something different? That Simon, son of Jonah. Why did Jesus say that? Why did suddenly Jesus talk about his father? Simon, son of Jonah. What was the point of that? Is that just accidental? Strange. No, there's a reason for that. Let's go to 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles. Chapter 9. I definitely won't ask anybody else to read this one. It has lots of, uh, lots of names. This is King David organising the service of the temple before the temple's built. Because David actually got all the building material together. He organised all the, the Levites and everything else before Solomon even laid the first stone. Um, so this is David setting things up. Um, so, 1 Chronicles, chapter 9, 17 to 27. Now the gatekeepers were Shalom, Akbag, Talmor, uh, Ahiman, and his relatives, Shalman, the chief, being stationed until now, until, until the, uh, the king's gate to the east. These were gatekeepers of the camp of the sons of Levi, and Shalman and Kor, 
the son of Elphaz, the son of Kor, and his relatives, and his family's house, the Korites, they were, uh, were over the work of the service of keepers, of the, thresh, uh, of the threshold of the tent, and their fathers had been over the camp of the Lord, keepers of the entrance. And Phinehas, son of Eliezer, was ruler over them previously, and the Lord was with him. And Zechariah, the son of Malshemiah, was gatekeeper of the entrance of the tent of meeting. All of these were chosen as gatekeepers of the threshold, were 121. These were enrolled by genealogy in their villages, whom David and Samuel, the seer, appointed over the officers Office of Trust. Enrolled by genealogy. Interesting. So these were people who had been over the king's gate. They had been charged in the tabernacle in the wilderness. They'd had official jobs in their families. These official jobs were passed down. David was now setting them up as the official gatekeepers of the temple, even though the temple hadn't been built. There's one name in interest in there, Phinehas, son of Elysia. Do you know the story of Phinehas, son of Eliezer, in the Bible? Why he was special? Why the God was with him? It's an interesting story. There's a picture of it underneath there. The one with the spear. Yeah. Go to Numbers. Somebody else can read this one for me. Numbers, 20, Numbers 25. This is why he was chosen and favoured by God. Um, what had happened beforehand, a chap called Balaam had been called up by one of the local kings to curse Israel and had s singularly failed to do so. Every time he tried to curse Israel, God had made him bless them. But he still wanted the payout, so he suggested to the king, this is the best way to destroy Israel. You can't destroy them externally, but you can destroy them internally. If you can get them to turn away from their God, if you can get them to worship other gods, God will get annoyed with them and destroy them. And he had a very successful way of doing it. He sent out all the, the king sent out all the beautiful girls down to the Israel and all the boys went, well, hey, off we go. Oh, come to my, our temple. We're having a celebration today and a worship. And off they went. And of course, exactly what Balaam said happened. God cursed them and a plague started to hit the land. So if someone would like to read. Well, Israel, Israel remained at Shittim. The people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. Well, they invited the people to the sacrifice of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor, uh, and the Lord was angry against Israel. The Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord, so that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judge, judges of Israel, Each of you slay his men who have joined themselves to Baal of Peor. Then behold, one of the sons of Israel came and brought to his relatives a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation of the sons of Israel. While they were weeping at the doorway of the tent of meeting, when Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he arose from the midst of the congregation and took a spear in his hand, and he went after the man of Israel into the tent and pierced both of them through. The man of Israel and the woman through the body, so that the plague of the sons of Israel was checked. Those who died by the plague were 24,000. Bit of a gruesome story. So the man and the woman were obviously enjoying themselves there when he came in and kudunk. And that is why Phinehas, God actually says to him, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel. In his jealousy, for he was jealous with my jealousy among them, so that I did not destroy the sons of Israel in my jealousy. So he is promoted and his children, as it were, become gatekeepers as well, because he's in charge of the gatekeepers, those who protect the house of the Lord, who protect Israel. Can you think of something where Peter did something where a man and a woman both died? That's it. 
Ananias and Sapphira? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Mm. You think, well, why was that? I mean, I mean, it's not quite as gruesome, gruesome as this story, but why? What was Peter doing? Peter was actually defending the church because what was happening here was greed. This was self-aggrandizement. Okay, they were giving money to the church, but they were lying about it. They didn't have to give it. Peter said, you, you don't have to give it. You could have kept it. You could have said, I'm giving half of it or tenth of it or whatever. Whatever you wanted to, you could have said. But you didn't. You lied. And you did it on purpose and you lied to the Holy Spirit. Kudunk. So here's Peter passing judgment. And where um, Jesus said to him, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. That was a way of passing judgment. That's what a judgment did when they passed judgment. So in a strange way, they're connected up. So here's Peter doing that. So you've got um, Ananias and Sapphira, that's uh, Acts 5. Let's go over the page. Let's talk about keys now. The keys of the kingdom. What did the keys of the kingdom actually mean? Let's go to Isaiah. There's an important passage that's in there that explains what the keys are all about. So it's Isaiah 22. If anybody would like to read this one for me, it's uh, 15 to 25. That is the Lord God. <coughs> Go, get thee unto this treasure, even unto Shechem, which is over the house, and say, What hast thou here? And whom hast thou here? That thou hast hewn thee out a sepulchre. A sepulchre here, as he that healed him out of it. Sorry. It's well, harder than the old old was. <coughs> yeah, yes, it's twice. As he that heweth him out a sepulchre on the high, and that graveth a habitation of himself in a rock. Behold, the Lord will carry thee away with a mighty captivity, and will surely cover thee. He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. There shalt thou die, and there the chariots of thy glory shall be the shame of thy. Lord's house. How many? Yeah, keep going. Okay. Yeah. And I will drive thee from the station, and from thy state shall he put thee down. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hezekiah, <coughs> and I will clothe him with thy bow, and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand. <coughs> And he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the king of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail in a short place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house the offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity, and the vessels of cups, even for all the vessels of dragons. And in that day, says the Lord Jesus, shall the nail that is fastened in a sure place be removed, and be cut down and fall, and the burden that was upon it shall be cut off, for the Lord had spoken it. Some strange stuff there, but did you notice the key of the house of David on his shoulder? Mm. Now, it's all about talking about nails in that version. Or have you got pegs in your version? Mm. A peg driven in a firm place? No. Mm. Um, if you take a look at the Bedouin tent, now you're probably thinking a, a peg is the thing that holds up the tent on the outside. In this case, it's not. The, you can see this, it's a higher section in the middle. In the middle there would be some particularly strong wooden poles and into those wooden poles there would be in one place um, wooden pegs driven in and those wooden pegs were a special place and they would hang on those the most precious things they had in the tent so that's where it talks about the bowls and things will be hung from this person 
So the idea is it's, it, it's, it's like a vault in the private area of the tent, and that's where the, the important things are held up. So here we have the steward of the house of David. The one who is doing it at the moment is obviously aggrandizing himself. He's cutting a, a tomb amongst the tombs of the kings. He's driving around on a chariot. He's lifting himself up. And God says, right, I'm gonna, as a peg, I'm going to break you off. You're making yourself too much. I'm, I like it. I'm going to roll you up into a ball and throw you into a fog, like a snowball and throw you away into a land. And I'll take somebody else and I'll put him in there instead. And his house and his relatives, will, they will be hung on that. That's what's happening with Peter. For this while, he's becoming the peg that many of the things in the church will be hung from. It's not permanent, but it's for a while he's becoming that peg. So that the house, the keys of the kingdom are being put on his shoulder for this while. So that's one of the principles there. Let's go to Exodus chapter 4. Same type of thing has happened here. This is what God has done with Moses. This is Moses at the burning bush, arguing with God, trying to find a dozen reasons why he shouldn't do the job. Can't really blame him, but there you go. And basically, he's, he said, I, 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 da, 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 I can't, can't, can't talk properly. I, I, I. So God gets a bit annoyed. Eh? Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses, and he said, Is there not your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently. And moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. You notice that God has already organised this before the burning bush incident has even started. And moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you he, you, he will be glad in his heart. And you will speak to him and put, the wor and put the words in his mouth. And I, even I, will be with your mouth and, with, and his mouth. And I will teach you what you are to do. Moreover, he shall speak for you to the people. And it shall come about that he shall be as a mouth for you and you shall be as God to him. So here's Moses, if you like, being turned into that peg. Moses is becoming God to Aaron, and through Aaron to the people. The people rebelled against God, it has to be said a number of times. But you see, here's God taking a person and putting them in a, a position of authority, a position of importance. Let's go to Matthew 23. Moses obviously isn't around by the time of Matthew, but there's some other people who are around. And Jesus said to the multitudes and his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. The chair of Moses. That was a literal seat in the synagogue, but it was the seat of being a god to the people, in biblical terms. Therefore, all they tell you to do, observe, but do not do according to their deeds. For they say things, and they do not do them. They tie heavy loads, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. But they do all these deeds to be noticed by men. And they broaden their phylacteries and they lengthen their tassels and their garments and they love the places of honour at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogue and respectful greetings in the marketplace and call, men calling them rabbi. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher and, uh, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth your father. What do they call the Pope? father and priest interestingly for one is your father he who is in heaven and do not be uh, called um, called leaders for one is your leader that is christ but the greatest amongst you shall be your servant and whoever exalts himself shall be humbled and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted 
Let's go to Luke. There's a further bit in this conversation, but I want to read it from Luke, not from, uh, not from Matthew. So it's Luke 11. Yeah, uh, Luke 11. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourself, and those who were entering in you hindered. The key of knowledge. The key of the kingdom. So that Moses had the key of knowledge, if you like. They were sitting in the seats of Moses. He was the one who went and spoke to God face to face. There's a passage that says, uh, God revealed his deeds to the people of Israel, but he revealed his ways to Moses. And there's a difference. Moses knew why. He asked the question, why? The people didn't. And that's, where, that's the difference here. Yes, yeah, go to John 10. John 10, verse 1 to 10. John 10. John 10. Uh, 1 to 10. It probably fits in here as well as anywhere else, to be honest. This is Jesus talking to the, um, the Pharisees, probably again. Truly I say unto you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold for the sheep, but climbs over some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth his own, he goes before them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. The stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him, because they do not know the voice of the stranger. This figure of speech Jesus spoke, but they did not understand the things he, which he was been saying to them. Jesus therefore said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thieves come only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that you might have life and might have in abundance. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. You have a doorkeeper. So you had those people in the, the Old Testament who were to keep the doors of the temple. They were the doorkeepers. They were to protect the temple, but their job was not to close the doors, their job was to open the door when they heard the voice of God and let the people in. Peter's job, he was given the keys. He's a doorkeeper. His job is to open the door and let the people in. It wasn't to close it and shut them out because they didn't do what they were supposed to do. It's interesting. Peter, in the, the, the next passage, we won't look it up, but can you remember the passage where Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I like you. Feed my sheep. Then feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Peter's not being made the good shepherd. He's being made the doorkeeper who looks after the sheep and opens the door up so that when the good shepherd speaks, he opens the door and the sheep can come through. That's his job. His job is to protect the sheep, to make sure that nobody else gets in there who shouldn't be in there. Ananias and Sapphira, some greed. So he's not the shepherd of the flock. We often think of bishops as shepherds, don't we? The word bishop, by the way, doesn't appear in the Bible anywhere. Only in the old authorised version. If you take a look at the pictures, there are three times Peter opens the door. One's at Pentecost. There's that sermon at Pentecost where the Spirit comes and it goes out to the Jewish people. There's another time at Samaria. Philip the Evangelist went to um, Samaria. He preached the gospel, but the Spirit didn't fall. They believed, but the Spirit didn't fall. It wasn't until Peter and John turned up and preached that the Spirit fell. That was Peter turning the door opening up the door and the spirit fell 
And there's another time at Caesarea when he's called to the, the centurion. Remember Cornelius the centurion? And the Holy Spirit rudely interrupts him halfway through his sermon and falls and baptises all these Gentiles. That's Peter turning the door, opening the door, and the Spirit come. So those are the three occasions Peter opened the door of the kingdom of heaven. And that door is open and cannot be closed by any Pope or anybody else. It's interesting, after that, if you look at Galatians, um, we won't look it up, but Peter, um, Paul's talking about the time he went up to Jerusalem. And the, the elders at Jerusalem recognised that he was the apostle to the Gentiles in the same way that Paul was the apostle to the Jews. Yeah, strike it, reverse it. You know, yeah. So Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, Peter was the apostle to the Jews. Yeah, go ahead. So it's interesting. After he's unlocked the doors, he's given another job. And he's a specific job, which interestingly does not involve becoming Pope in Rome. Um, it's interesting, I read a Catholic website and there's a part in um, one of the books of Peter, he says, those in Babylon salute you. And they're saying, well, that has to be Rome because Babylon wasn't there anymore. And he's just using that word to say that Rome is Babylon. But Babylonia was there and there's a big Jewish, in fact, until 50 years ago, there's a big Jewish population in Babylonia because a lot of them didn't return from the exile. So as the apostle to the Gentile, where was Peter going to go to where the Jews were? Of course, the, the, the Catholic thing I read said, no, this just meant Rome. That meant he went to Rome and he was the, he's the Pope in Rome. Yeah, right. The doors are open. Let's go to Acts 14. This is Paul. This is Peter. Oh, sorry, this is Paul speaking now. It's interesting that Paul is converted before Peter goes to Cornelius. But Peter or Paul is not called to go to the Gentiles until after Cornelius. Peter had to open that door first before the gospel could go out to the Gentiles. So if you go to Acts, um, Acts 14, and from there they sailed to Antioch, from which they had been commenced to the grace of God for the work. This is our Paul and Barnabas, I think. Uh, and they had, that they had accomplished. And when they arrived, they gathered the church together and they began to report all things that God had done um, with them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And there's many times, have you ever heard the expression pushing on doors in Christian circles? The idea is, has God unlocked this door? Has God unlocked this door? And sometimes, there's another time when Peter said, there's, a, there's a, a wide door. I think he was in Ephesus at the time or something like that. He said, there's a wide door of faith at this place. And I'm going through it. I'm preaching through it. Let's go to Revelations. Revelations, chapter 3. This is the, the seven churches of Revelations. Those of you who listen to the um, the Great and Glorious Days thing, I did a, in fact the longest one I did was on the seven churches. And they are seven actual churches. There are seven types of churches, but there's also a way of looking at them which they are seven church ages. Have you heard of the, the expression zeitgeist? The spirit of the age. If we go to the Church of Philadelphia, which is chapter 3 verse 7, Looking at that, if you take this idea, this is the, what we call the missionary church. So this is after the Reformation, when the European empires were increasing and European missionaries were going out around the world. It is now fashionable to look down upon missionaries as stormtroopers of empire. Those who were sent out to pacify the natives before the thing. That is unfair utterly unfair. A lot of these people went out when there was no protection at all. And they went out into the middle of nowhere. 
Let's read this. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write. So think of this as the, the, the Christian missionaries who were going out from the European empires. He who is holy and true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts, who shuts and no one opens, says, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have, because you have little power, and you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews, but are not. In that case, I think that's probably Christians who say they are Christians, but are not. But lie, behold, I will make them come and bow down to your feet, and they will know that I have loved you. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I will also keep you in the hour of testing, that hour which is to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. Behold, um, hold fast to what you have in order that no one should take your crown. He who overcomes, I shall make him a pillow in the temple of my God, and, I, um, and he will go out from it no more. And I will write upon him a new name, the name of my God, and the, city, uh, na the name of God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes out of heaven. For my God and my new name, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. That is the greatest of the seven churches, quite frankly. That's the only church that God does not criticise. They're the ones who were given an opportunity. At the time of Paul and Peter, the Roman Empire was corrupt and horrible, but it gave them an opportunity. They could travel anywhere. They could go anywhere. At the time of the expanding empires, they could go anywhere. They could travel anywhere. And suddenly, so, so <coughs> yes, Satan would say that the, the Christian missionaries were a bad thing. But he would say that, wouldn't he? And that's what's happening in the world. People are looking down on the missionaries. What we are now is at the end of this church age. This is the age when there's no, very few missionaries going out. In fact, Africa's sending more missionaries over here than we're sending to Africa. This is coming to an end. Have you heard of Jim Elliot? Yes. Jim Elliot. To be honest, as a missionary, he's a little bit of a failure. He, studied for his whole life to be a missionary, decided he was going to go to the most difficult group in America he could find, who were really hostile to everybody. He eventually found that group and they killed him and his friends. In fact, really, it's his wife Elizabeth who should be praised to the highest. She got together the, the sisters, the wives. They went back out and they evangelised the very tribe that killed him. But he has the best one-liner in all of missionary folks. He who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose is no fool. Mm -hmm. That's the best one-liner in missionaries. And that is true of the Philadelphia church. It is true of those who have gone out. And it says in there, hold on to what you have. Don't let anybody take away your crown. We are at the end of that age. After Philadelphia comes Laodicea, the lukewarm church, the church where God is on the outside knocking to be allowed in. A church which will look at the Bible and go, we don't like that bit, let's rip that bit out. Can I say let's something? Yeah. My mum and dad, or grandma, they were grandma, at the book. At the bottom of their staircase, somebody had given them um, a plaque, sort of plaster plaque, with Jesus knocking on the door. Mm. Now, I was the first one to come to Jesus because I was at the Sunday school. In the course of time, my brother, by, by the time he was married, he also had come to Jesus, and my mother and father had come to accept Jesus as their saviour when they were in their late sixties 
and yet me as a little child, every time I went up that, that stair, I saw that plaque. Praise the Lord, and all well. Yeah. The family came to the Lord, long time, but they came. Yeah. Mm. It's another door. They didn't want to know when mm. I, they thought I was, I was going to give them a man away. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, was it? And Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary sitting opposite the grave. And on the next day, which was the one after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate and said, Sir, they're being nice now, aren't they? Sir, they weren't saying that before. We remember when he was alive that this deceiver said, After three days I am to rise again. Therefore, give orders that the grave be made secured until the third day, lest the disciples come and steal him away and say to the people, He has risen from the dead, and his last deception be worse than the first. Pilate therefore said to them, You have a guard, go and make it secure. And they went and made the grave secure, along with the guard, and they set a seal on the stone. Now after the Sabbath had begun to dawn towards the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, an earthquake had occurred. An angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat on it. And you have never seen a smugger angel in your life. When God has opened the door, death won't keep you now. That's what Jim Elliot knew. Death is not the end, and it will not keep you out. But the door will close. Go to Genesis chapter 7. The door of salvation is open to the earth. It's 11 to 16. In the 600th year of Noah's life, he started building the ark, by the way, when he was 500 years old. In the second month, on the 17th day of the month, in the same day, all the foundations of the, the deep burst open and the floodgates of the sky were opened and the rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. On the same day, so this is when the rain has started, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth and, and his and Noah's wife and his, three, and his three wives of his sons entered the ark. They and every beast after them of their kind, all the cattle of their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the, the earth after its kind, every bird after its kind, all sorts of birds. So they went into the ark um, to Noah by twos of all flesh that was to breathe, of the, in which was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female, of all flesh, entered as God had commanded, and the Lord closed it behind them. There will come a point when the door to the kingdom will be closed and sealed up, and it will be too late. That is not now, I'm glad to say. Jesus is now having to knock on the doors of the church to be said, well, let me in. Jesus is having to, and right up to the end, until the rain of judgment starts to fall, that door will be opened. And even as the rain is falling, and people are going into it at the end, but there will come a time when that door is closed. I don't believe in apostolic succession, as the church would put it, but I do believe in apostolic succession in God's plan in as much as for each of you, there was somebody in your life who brought the message to you. Somebody who opened that door and you heard the voice of the shepherd calling you through. At Pentecost and these other things, this wasn't God's kingdom coming on earth. This was those people leaving the earth. We are not of this world. They were entering into the kingdom of heaven. There will be a day when the kingdom of heaven will come on earth, but that wasn't it. And every single one of you will come to, in contact with other people. And it's your job to open the door 
so that the voice of the shepherd could be heard by them. And there has been a succession down through the history of one person telling another, telling another, telling another, telling another. And God has sent people into your life. An apostle means one who is sent. And God has organised a far better apostolic succession than the church has managed. And he has sent true people. The humble, the unknown, the ones that this world has never known. He's sent them into people's lives and he's changed their lives because he's they brought the message in. And that is our job. In this darkening world, our job is to open the door and to let them hear the word of God, their good shepherd calling them through us. It's God's job to get them into the kingdom of heaven. It's our job just to make sure that door is open in the right place and at the right time. I heard, uh, have you ever seen the program um, uh, Life Below Zero? It's about people in Alaska. And one of the characters on that said, preparedness plus opportunity brings luck. He, did, he wasn't calling it luck, basically. You've got to be prepared. The opportunity's got to come along and then it happens. There's no such thing as luck. But we have to be prepared so that when God puts the opportunity, when someone comes into the church to pray, someone was here at eight o'clock in the morning for no apparent reason, apart from God sent you there. That's what we are to do with our life. At the moment, if you like, the keys of the kingdom are on our shoulders. They will pass on to others. Well, that's what we've got to do. I shall leave it there. We'll end with a word of prayer. Father, thank you that you are organising this and not us. Lord, you see the end from the beginning. You know everything. Lord, may we be open to you and to hear your word and to be in the right place at the right time. And to be prepared for the job that you have for us. Lord, help us to do your will. Amen. And amen. Thank you, everybody. I'll probably get excommunicated from the Church of England because they believe they're an apostolic succession as well. So. Only a priest can bless the bread uh, for communion. So that's yes. Yeah, so you can't do communion unless there's as a priest has been present or has blessed it in advance. Um, so unless we have we have an, a retired minister here, yes, who can bless it. So, but you couldn't do communion. You couldn't do things like that. So there's a whole load of things that can't be done. Uh, I mean the. Ministers have to be appointed. I mean, I, I get really dubious about there's some preachers who regard themselves as bishops and they announce themselves to the world as bishops who haven't been um, authorised or appointed. Um, yeah, so you have to have a system where people are properly authorised and properly accepted. But that's not apostolic succession. That's not taking that as when people...